This is Matt Dean with A-Plus College Ready, and today we're going to talk a little bit about community ecology. So a community in ecology consists of all the different populations that share a habitat and interact with each other. So they're living in the same place at the same time. Community, community ecologists mostly study interspecific, between different species, interactions that drive the patterns of diversity and distribution in nature. Examples of these interspecific interactions include things like competition, predation, and symbiosis. So competition is considered to be a negative, negative type of interaction. And that's because it has a negative impact on, on both species that are involved. When different species compete with each other, they do so because they have overlapping niches. A niche is a, like an ecological role. It's where something lives and what it does and the natural resources that it uses. So when two species niches overlap, they compete. The competitive exclusion principle states that two species with exactly the same niche can't stably coexist in the same habitat. And that's because they're continually competing for the same resources. One of those species is going to go extinct eventually. In some cases, competing species evolve, and they evolve to modify their niches, and that limits competition. This is sometimes called resource partitioning, and it may involve something like one of the species evolving to use a different resource, or occupy a different part of the habitat, or maybe feed during a completely different part of the day. Predation is a type of plus minus relationship or interaction. So it's called that because it benefits one of the, the partners, in this case, the predator, and it hurts the prey. Uh, we typically think of predation as being one animal eating another animal, but predation also refers to herbivory. And this is when an animal feeds on, on a plant. The, the interactions between the predators and the prey often lead to co-evolution in which the prey um, evolve adaptations and protections against predation and the predators evolve to become more efficient at their predation. So symbiosis is a, a long-term kind of association, interspecific interaction in which two different species live together and depend on each other in some way. There's several types of symbiotic relationships in nature. One of them is mutualism. This is a positive, positive relationship. It's called that because both species involved in the relationship benefit. An example of a mutualistic relationship would be the, the mycorrhiza. So mycorrhiza are fungi that grow on the roots of certain plants. The fungi increase the surface area of the roots and they help to provide more water and nutrients to the plants. While the plants, on the other hand, provide fun, the fungi, sugars, and other organic molecules and a place to live. The relationship works for both. Turns out some plants can't live without the mycorrhiza. And some of those fungi can't live without the plants. So it's a really important relationship for both organisms. Uh, a lichen is another example of a mutualistic relationship. So this is a fungus. Grows usually on the sides of trees. It looks kind of greenish or bluish. Living within that fun fungus is either some kind of algae or cyanobacteria. So the algae or cyanobacteria provide sugars because they can do photosynthesis. And the fungus provides shelter, a place to live, and protection. It's a mutualistic relationship. It's good for both. Commensalism is another type of symbiotic relationship. Now, this is a plus zero relationship because one of the partners benefits and the other isn't affected either in a positive or negative way. A good example of this are the bacteria that live on human skin. The bacteria live on the skin, they feed on dead skin, so they benefit, but they don't really hurt or help the human that they're living on. That's commensalism. Parasitism is a plus minus relationship. Uh, positive because the parasite gets a positive impact, negative because the host um, is harmed by the relationship. Good example of a parasitic relationship is the tapeworm that lives inside the human body. While in the intestines where it mostly lives, it absorbs nutrients 
Um, so it gets a place to live. It gets free food. The host, on the other hand, loses calories. Also, the tapeworm larva at least can spread to the brain and, and ultimately kill the host. So can be bad, really bad for the host. Ticks would be another example of a parasite, a, an organism that feeds on the blood of a host and causes it harm. So there we see our interspecific interactions, competition, a negative-negative relationship, predation, a plus-minus relationship. And notice here they group parasitism in with predation. Mutualism, good for both, a plus-plus relationship. And commensalism, good for one of the partners, doesn't affect the other partner either in a positive or negative way. So now let's talk a bit about community structure. Ecologists often talk about species richness and species diversity. Before we get into the rest of this slide, let's, let's define those two terms. So species diversity is a measure of both species richness and the relative abundance of each species. So really before you can understand this definition, you need to understand this one. Species rich, richness is a, is a measure of the number of different species found in a community. How many different kinds of things live in a place? So diversity is that, the species richness, plus how common are each one of those species. Habitats um, that are high in species richness and diversity tend to be more stable and better able to re recover after some kind of environmental disturbance. And here we see that again. Um, communities with the highest levels of species richness are usually those found near the equator, usually in biomes like the tropical rainforest. And that's because there's lots of water, there's lots of nutrients, there's lots of food, there's lots of resources there. So there's a diagram on the next slide that shows species, the species richness of mammals in North and South America. The darker the shade of green, the higher the species, species richness. And notice that by far the most rich areas are here. And that's right where the equator runs. That's mostly tropical rainforest. And notice in terms of where it's not very rich, up here and down here, where we're talking really cold areas, the Arctic and, and near Antarctica. So let's talk about some factors that shape the structure of a community. Um, they can be biotic or abiotic, living or non-living. Um, we're talking about things like the climate patterns, the geography, it's mountainous or not, the heterogeneity of the environment. Is the environment the same all the way throughout or are there clumps of different things within the environment? The frequency of disturbances, things like fires, floods, even things like earthquakes could be a factor. And then also the interactions between organisms, competition, predation, symbiosis. All of those can affect the shape of a community. So let's talk about organisms that are sometimes referred to as foundation species. These are organisms that play important roles in creating and defining a community. Oftentimes they modify the environment and help it to be more uh, able to support other organisms. A good example of a foundation species are kelp. So kelp are these brown algae that essentially form almost like underwater forest in the oceans off the coast of California. So these forests then become the homes of all kinds of organisms, things like seals, all kinds of fish. Um, so they form the foundation of the community. Coral is another good example of a foundation species. The reefs that are, are made by the coral form a, a essentially a, an environment that all kinds of other fish, um, crustaceans, um, sea anemones, all kinds of things live in that area that was created essentially by the coral. Let's don't confuse foundation species with keystone species. A keystone species is one that has a disproportionately large effect on the community structure relative to its biomass or abundance. Um, keystone species usually belong to higher trophic levels. They're usually some type of predator and they can act in a lot of diverse ways. A really famous example of a keystone species is a specific sea star uh, found in the intertidal waterways in the northwestern U.S. Um, 
So there's a famous experiment where the sea stars were removed from the intertidal zone. So they were completely taken out of their environment. Um, when they came out, the populations of their prey, which were the mussels, exploded. They went essentially through exponential growth. But what that ended up doing is that altered the different species that were found in that community. Uh, but while the sea stars were there, there were about over 2,500 species of, of barnacles and algae that lived in these little intertidal zones. But once the sea stars were removed, the mussel population expanded so dramatically that almost all of those barnacles and algae uh, went extinct because essentially the mussels pushed them out or fed on them. So this, this sharp reduction in diversity oftentimes happens when a keystone species is removed from the environment. Another really important keystone species that you'll hear a lot about is the shark. Here we can see um, an example. So sharks feed on these rays. The rays feed on these bivalves and arthropods. Um, when the sharks are removed, the rays, um, their population increases dramatically. Now there's so many of those that they end up killing off um, lots of the crustaceans, lots of the bivalves, lots of the arthropods, and the populations collapse. And eventually, that's going to probably also kill out their rays in the long run. It's called a keystone species. A keystone is a, the stone at the top of an arch that essentially holds the arch together. So if that keystone is removed, the arch falls. If a keystone species is removed from a, from a food chain or an environment, it, 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 it falls. It falls apart. Let's also talk about invasive species. So these are species that are in, introduced to an area outside of where they normally are found, their native range. Oftentimes, because there's no natural predators for these invasive species there, they outcompete and they outreproduce the native species and they can cause the population size of native species to drop or even sometimes go extinct. One of the most famous examples of an invasive species is kudzu. So this was an ornamental type of vine plant brought in from, from Asia. Um, and it, it grew and now it's taken over large parts of the South. Uh, Asian carp were introduced uh, into U.S. waterways to get rid of algae, but they reproduced so fast that now up to 95% of the biomass in some, some U.S. waterways is made up of these Asian carp. They've pushed everything else essentially near extinction in those waterways. Some other famous examples are the pythons that have been introduced into the Everglades and are competing with alligators and pushing their numbers down. The snakehead fish, which has become a huge problem in Florida. And even things like the rabbit, which were introduced to Australia and competed with the kangaroo and caused some massive problems there as well. The last thing we'll talk about in this particular screencast is a topic called ecological succession. So succession is a series of progressive changes in the composition of a community over time. In many cases, it involves a progression from less stable, less diverse communities to more stable uh, communities with much higher species diversity. We oftentimes talk about two kinds of succession. Those are primary succession and secondary succession. So let's start off by talking about primary succession. This occurs when new land is formed uh, possibly by like the hardening of lava, new rock, or when bare rock uh, is exposed, maybe on a mountain through erosion. Once this barren rock is formed or exposed, weathering and erosion and other natural forces start to break down the rock and begin the process of making soil. Certain plants and, and lichens, which don't need much soil, colonize this rocky area. They're known as pioneer species. They're able to live there because they don't need much soil and they get their calories from, from sunlight. They, they do photosynthesis. Eventually, some of them die and their bodies um, start to form organic matter in the soil. And they also help to break down the soil, by the rock, by growing into it. This part of the process is very slow, takes a long time to make fertile, rich soil. But once soil formation progresses to a certain point, bigger plants start to move in. Um, so new species move into the habitat, 
these cause changes in the environment, um, which lead to different species moving in. They cause changes in the environment, which cause different species to move in. And the newly arriving species oftentimes replace the ones that were there before, the predecessors. At some point, the community reaches a, a relatively stable state. Sometimes this is called the climax community. But it's important to note that the change never stops and that ecosystems are constantly in, in, in evolving or succeeding. Um, change may slow, but it never really ceases. So here's a diagram sort of showing us how primary succession happens. So we start off with the bare rock. We get things like lichens, which help to speed up the process of soil formation and just contribute some organic matter. Then we get some small annual type plants, some year long living plants. The soil gets deeper. We get grasses and some perennials starting to move in. Again, the soil continues to get deeper. All of those are called pioneer species. They move in before the soil is really ready. Then we get intermediate species, things like grasses, shrubs, some trees that can handle environments that are really sunny, things like pine trees. Um, again, they help to cause the soil to get deeper and deeper and deeper. And eventually we get more shade tolerant trees, um, things like hickory and oak hardwoods. Uh, they eventually form a big canopy, push out a lot of the other plants that were already there and they live long term. They're kind of a case selected species. So the environment becomes more stable. We call that the climax community. So this is primary succession. This takes a long, long time because mostly it takes a long time for the, the process of soil formation to, uh, to occur. Secondary succession, on the other hand, happens in a previously occupied habitat. But that habitat is being recolonized after some kind of disturbance, a disturbance that kills much or pretty much all of the community. We're talking about things like maybe a fire or a flood or a clear cut where um, farmers or builders have come in and completely cleared off an area of land. Uh, so a classic example of this would be wildfires in like an oak or hickory forest. So they burn away most of the vegetation. They kill or at least cause to flee the animals, but the nutrients and the soil are still there. So the, sometimes that the, the fire actually makes the soil more nutrient rich because it burns up and just can puts more, more nutrients back into the soil. So that means that that secondary succession is going to happen much faster than primary succession because the soil is already there. They don't have to form new soil. So before the fire, there was probably an oak and hickory forest that had a lot of species diversity and was uh, pretty stable. Um, but after the fire, the trees aren't, the trees are gone. So the first plants to move back in are usually annuals like grasses. Um, they don't live very long. Um, within a few years, we start to get bigger grasses followed by shrubs, followed by, um, things like pine trees that don't handle shade too well. And then eventually we get the hardwoods that are coming back. And over a period of say 150 or so years, we'll get back a community, eventually a hardwood forest that's very similar to the one that was there originally. So the moral of the story is here that secondary succession happens much faster than primary succession because it's happening in a place that already has soil but that area was just disturbed by some kind of natural disaster, like a flood or a fire, or maybe a human made disaster, like a clear cut. So here we see secondary succession. So we start off with an oak hickory hardwood forest. We have a fire burns away most everything. Then we get new pioneer species moving in things like the annual plants, the grasses followed by the intermediate species like the shrubs and the pines uh, until eventually, our hardwood forest grows back and we're back to a more stable type climax community with an oak hickory hardwood forest. All right, that's it for our screencast on community ecology.